You know, for some reason, I'm actually feeling kind of confident about tonight's game between Arkansas and Texas A&M. Let's talk about why. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors. I'm also the host of Out of Bounds. You can catch every weekday afternoon from 1 to 4 on 103.7 The Buzz and 1037thebuzz.com. Hope everybody's having a wonderful Wednesday, and hopefully you had a wonderful Valentine's Day with your significant other. I know I sure did. But a lot of things going on in Razorback land that we're going to talk about today, mainly basketball, but we'll get into some football news there as well when it comes to the spring schedule but tonight arkansas texas a&m facing off once again in college station it's going to be an 8 p.m tip at reed arena it's gonna be on espn too i really don't i don't like the 8 p.m tips I, I don't i know that some people do and i get that they have to do it that way but they never start on time it's a tradition like no other so this game will actually not get tipped until like 8 15 and it ends up going really late. And of course, I got to do the post game show on the buzz, which I enjoy doing, but just like I don't get out of there till like midnight. It doesn't matter. I'm complaining here just selfishly, but still. Uh, Arkansas AM is going to be an 8 p.m. game tonight. And uh, Arkansas was able to take care of business in the first game between these two opponents back in uh, Bud Walton Arena earlier this year. 81 to 70 was the final score. So Arkansas is familiar with uh, with Texas A&M and with Buzz Williams, and Arkansas is actually under Eric Musselman 4-3 and three against Buzz Williams. I was surprised by that because for some reason I felt like Texas A&M always did really good against Arkansas and under Muss. I thought that it would be the opposite, but I guess when you look at it, uh, Arkansas has won every game at home against A&M, and they've lost every game on the road against A&M. Therefore, that's why they're 5-3 and three, or 4-3. and three. So this is going to be an opportunity for Arkansas to get that first win in Reed, at least uh, for Eric Musselman, uh, to take care of business down there too. And it, it's weird because if you remember that first game, Arkansas actually had 17 turnovers in that game, like a ton of turnovers. And they also gave up 24 offensive rebounds. Just absurd numbers. But yet they still won by 11. And honestly, it was just an incredible performance shooting-wise from Arkansas because they shot around 50%, while the Texas A&M Maggies only shot around 34%. Uh, Mikel Mitchell was the breakout player because he had nine points, seven, uh, nine points, 13 rebounds and seven block shots. It's amazing. It feels like that game was so long ago, yet it actually wasn't. And then we start thinking about it I'm like, yeah, that was kind of one of the, the big time games that Arkansas desperately needed in order to uh, get things back on track and at least to have a quality quality win on their schedule for uh, what they've been trying to do. So anyways, that was January 31st. Now we're at February 15th. So just a couple of weeks later. And since that point in time, AM is actually taking care of business. Uh, they're still just 10 and 2 in conference play with their two losses coming against Kentucky at home and Arkansas. Uh, actually, it may have been Kentucky on the road, but still, just those two losses is uh, all that Texas AM has in conference play. They're still trying to build up their resume. They haven't really gotten to the point yet where uh, they need to be or should be when it comes to being a lock into the NCAA tournament, which is wild because if you think about 10 and 2 in conference play, it's pretty impressive. They also did a clean sweep of Auburn, which is impressive. But it's like for what they are, you feel like they should be a higher seed or at least should be more solid solidified into the tournament. But because of their weaker non-conference schedule, they had some pretty bad losses in the non-conference schedule, too. They've had a lot of groundwork to make up to. So they're still trying to have some big quality wins to be able to get into the NCAA tournament, which I'm not saying like if it happened today, they would be in. But I'm just saying like they're still at like that eight, nine seed slot where a couple of losses down the stretch here and there could make it a little bit difficult for them to do it. So that's why this game tonight is so important for Texas A&M in order to continue to have that solidification of the NCAA tournament appearance. And Arkansas is also in the same regard because they're sitting at six and six in conference play. And I can't help but like look at that number and it almost feels the same way as it did when it was Razorback football being six and six overall this past year. It's like, yeah, they're six and six. But man, they they're they're a better team than six and six. They should have won more games than just six games. It has the same feeling there. Now, granted, different circumstances and different reasons why. But with Arkansas basketball, you know they start off one and five, and since that point they've been five and one. So you've you've been playing a lot better. And that Mississippi State game is just a really frustrating one. The LSU game is still going to be the one that haunts you the most because that's the only win they have in conference play, and that one just sucks. So that one, that one's going to be a tough one to do. But still, 
you're you're doing what you're doing better now. You're doing much better right now. And I think that because of the time that when these two teams faced off against each other around the first time, I liked what Arkansas did matchup wise. I really did. I thought the Mitchell twins did a really good job. Uh, I thought that Jalen Graham did a really good job. Obviously, shooting 50% from the field is always going to be helpful. But the fact that you gave up that many offensive rebounds and turned the ball over that many times and still won the game gives me a lot of hope that, okay, in this game, you might be able to do a little bit differently when it comes to how many turnovers you have, hopefully, and also uh, the times where you have uh, offensive rebounds that are given up. Like You might be able to take care of business in that regard. And this is another cool thing I feel like from Eric Musselman. Very few times, it's happened before, but very few times does Musselman win, uh, lose the second go around against a team that he plays twice in a season. Very seldom. Uh, I think the one of the few times that happened, like last year, I think Tennessee, at the end of the regular season, Arkansas lost that game in Knoxville when they beat them earlier. So I know that that was the case. They clean swept uh, LSU last year, but they lost to AM, but beat them the second time. Uh, you know, Arkansas did lose to Missouri this year, but lose this uh, beat Missouri this year, lose the second time. So it does happen on occasion. I'm not trying to say that it doesn't, but the thing is, is that they still have uh, great adjustments and things that are going to be different from the time to the time that these two teams met last time. I think Nick Smith is obviously a huge factor in all of that, and he's going to continue to get integrated into the team, continue to get integrated into uh, you know what they're trying to do and what they're trying to to get going offensively. So I feel like that's going to provide a really great spark for Arkansas there too. But a and is really good at getting to the free throw line. We know that. So that's going to be keys. Just I think Razorbacks have done so much of a better job of not fouling. Uh, they still do have fouls here and there. So it's not to say that they're perfect from it. But compared to where they were before, they have made adjustments. And I think that they are fouling at a lot less of a clip than what they were before. So hopefully that'll be something that comes into play. Home court advantage sometimes gives you that. But I'll just be hard pressed to think that Arkansas allows AM to go to the free throw line and shoot it 40 times. Like, let's just hope that's not the case. Cause if it does end up being the case, that's bad news for Arkansas. So lay off the fouls, especially down inside. AM's done such a good job at it. But looking at the numbers themselves, Arkansas actually is higher ranked when it comes to the net rankings, the Ken Palm rankings, the KPI, all of those things. They have the higher rankings. So Arkansas does have a lot more quality wins and as well as uh, being re regarded as far as the math and analytics go as a better basketball team. Now, looking at the numbers between these two teams when it comes to offense, and again, thanks for hogsports.com putting all this together uh, in such a great way. Subscribe to them if you haven't already. But uh, offensive efficiency, Arkansas is actually number eight in the SEC, where a and is number two. So their offensive efficiency is really good. Uh, field goal percent, effective field goal percentage, dead even at number three, which is really good. Turnover percentage, though, this is where it gets crazy. So Arkansas is 13th in the SEC in turnover percentage. That's awful. Bad. Second to last. AM is about middle of the pack at seven. Offensive rebound percentage, AM is number one, as you saw and as we saw against Arkansas earlier this year. Arkansas actually is pretty good at number four. Free throw rate, number one for AM. Number three for Arkansas. So both teams get to the free throw line. That's going to play a huge factor into this game of who can make their free throws. AM did not make much of their free throws the first time around. Arkansas did. So uh, that's going to be key. Arkansas actually has a better two point percentage, but within uh, inside the arc, they are a better shooting team than what AM is. I think a lot of that has to do with the layups and the dunks that Arkansas has. They're number two compared to number four. Three point percentage, though, neither team's great. We know Arkansas is not great. They're at number 10, which is better than what they were. And I feel like uh, this past game against Mississippi State definitely made that go lower. But uh, a and number seven. So neither team is just an elite three-point shooting team. Free throw percentage. Now, this is killer. a and is number one getting to the free throw line, and they're number three in the SEC at free throw percentage. Arkansas is number three getting to the free throw line, but number 12 in free throw percentage. That's disgusting, and that's terrible. They have gotten better, but still not where it needs to be. And then the tempo is Arkansas's game, number three in the SEC compared to number nine. So if they get... AM into the tempo, into the high clip, into the high rate of what it's supposed to be, then I think it could really play into Arkansas's uh, hand there too. Now, the defensive side of the basketball, defensive efficiency, AM is actually number four while Arkansas is number seven. So Arkansas's defense has been really good, but it's almost like they there's just those random games that will happen, like whether it's the Vanderbilt game or whether it's the uh, Mississippi State game where they scored more points than their average. It's like always those games that just that team scores more than what they're supposed to or what they should, but Arkansas still finds ways uh, to in other games to be suffocating defensively. So both teams are really good defensively. 
Uh, both teams are really good at opposing teams. Field goal percentage, number five for AM and the SEC, number six for Arkansas. Turnover percentage as far as causing turnovers, a and number four, while Arkansas is number six. So as good as Arkansas is, is causing turnovers, a and is slightly better. Uh, Two-point defense, Arkansas is better at than uh, AM, number four, number five. Three-point defense. Now, this is something that I really thought Arkansas was better at than what uh, was regarded. I, I really did. I know that it's tough to play three-point defense in, re- in general, but I thought Arkansas did a really good job of it. They're 13th in SEC in three-point defense. Some people are going to be like, well, have you seen some of these games that they've played in? Have you seen some of the games like at Vanderbilt and Mississippi State this past weekend? Yeah, I guess so, but I didn't realize it was that bad, but it is. Uh, A&M is number four at three-point defense. Well, luckily, Arkansas doesn't need to play much three-point. They shouldn't be shooting many threes, so hopefully that doesn't play a factor into it. Uh, Arkansas is number one in the SEC in block percentage. A&M's 12, so they don't do block a lot of shots. Steal percentage, Arkansas is five. Compared to A&M, it's number 10. Offensive rebound percentage defensively, uh, that Arkansas gives up uh, at number nine as far as how many offensive rebounds they give up percentage-wise. A&M's fourth. And then free throw rate defensively. Arkansas allows the teams to shoot a lot of free throws because they're number 12 in the SEC and a and number seven, middle of the pack. So if you just look at the numbers themselves across the board, Arkansas is actually not that great when it comes to just what you look at on paper. But the one thing that you got to always take into consideration, of course, is the fact that it is a deal with Arkansas and, um, you know, the way that they played the games that they've won and the fact that they played uh, A&M earlier this year and Arkansas actually matched up really well against them. It's going to be a dogfight no matter what. I think Arkansas can go in and win. a and I think, is favored, according to FanDuel, by uh, four points, which is not surprising for the home team. But uh, the one thing about AM too, is they've, they're starting to build up some quality wins, but they still don't have the tough schedule that a lot of other teams had. Like, they've, they've beaten Auburn twice, and that's huge. Those, those are big wins. Those are big wins. And they've beat Missouri at home. But besides that, they really don't have anybody else on the schedule that they played in the SEC, that is, that they could point to and say, okay, well, here's our quality wins. Like, they've already played LSU twice, uh, which we know how bad they are. They've played Georgia twice, uh, which is – or no, they haven't played Georgia. They played Florida twice. They beat them both times. Uh, They have played – see, the other teams are going to play. Of course, they're going to play Arkansas twice. They're going to play Missouri again, too. And, uh, yeah, so a lot of their toughest games are down the stretch. They have Arkansas, Missouri, Tennessee, Mississippi State, Ole Miss, and Alabama. Besides Ole Miss, those are all pretty good teams. So uh, they're going to get to it. So both teams need this. I think Arkansas can take care of business as long. Like, they bounce back well after bad losses. I think Nick Smith's going to be better. I think the offense is going to be better. I think they're going to be motivated and pissed off that they lost that game to Mississippi State. And I think they're going to come out firing, and I think it's going to be a big win for Arkansas. So I'm sure that won't go wrong for me. I'm sure that I'll call it completely perfectly, and there'll be no problems whatsoever. But I don't know. I just feel confident in it. I'm not saying that if they lose that it's all over and it's terrible and no sky is falling, but I'm just saying I like Arkansas in this game. I do. We'll see if it actually happens. they got to take care of business. Uh, But some people are wanting must to change. And we'll talk about what I mean by that here in just a second. But, folks, the midway point of the NBA season is here and now, and it's the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get the no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet does not win. So just download the FanDuel Sports app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and to threes drained as well. Plus, FanDuel lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss your chance to get on the snow sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NBA. You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so continuing on with the Locked On Razorbacks podcast, some people want must to change. And this is something that I was basing it on with a, a caller on my uh, radio show on Out of Bounds on 1037 The Buzz, where, and, and he wasn't just the only one. There's been people that have said it that talk about must in his, uh, you know, roster management or game management when it comes to guys getting a certain amount of minutes, guys playing too much, guys that are tired late in games, uh, whatever it may be. And how they don't need to be playing 35 plus minutes per game. And specifically talking about guys like Anthony Black, uh, Ricky Council, and Devo Davis. 
And so I thought about that and I was like, you know, these are the types of things that never become problems until Arkansas starts having some struggles. Like Arkansas in year one under must. Do you realize that three guys on that team played like 35 plus minutes every game? Like Mason Jones, Isaiah Joe, and Jimmy Witt played 35 plus minutes almost every game. And then I think Desi Sills brought in about 31, 32. So you had really just four players playing essentially every single game. And then, you know, even in the past few years, you've had guys, there's always been players that have averaged 35 minutes or more. You know, sometimes it was, uh, you know, Moses Moody in that year. Justin Smith was close to that too. You know, last year, J.D. Note, Jalen Williams played a lot. Stanley Mude ended up, uh, you know, bringing up and increasing his minutes, which I think he ended up averaging only like 27 minutes. But if you take into account like how little he played in the beginning of the year, once conference play came around and started getting going, he started really adding up the minutes and was averaging over 30 minutes a game. So that was something there too. And then this year you got Council, Black, and Devo essentially averaging over 30 minutes a game. And some people were just bringing it up. It's like, yeah, this is why you need to give them rest. You need to throw in other guys like Opinion and Darian Ford and all these. And I'm like, you know, I disagree. I disagree with that uh, wholeheartedly. Because one, I know Eric Musselman, and Eric Musselman has proven time and time again, he's one of the elite coaches in college basketball. And obviously he knows best. He knows a lot more about his roster and about his team than I will ever know. And a lot of us will ever know. But I was just like hearing this. And it just is so funny to me how people take this or approach this when it comes to how uh, how they view Musselman and how it's like, oh, well, he needs to change. He needs to do this. He needs to do that. And I just I just disagree. I just I just completely and totally disagree with that. I think what he does is a phenomenal job at managing his roster and managing his time because as, and I'll never forget, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again, his first year when he was being asked, because Arkansas was used to Mike Anderson and his teams where if anybody played over 30 minutes, it was something that was a little off. And so I remember uh, somebody asking Muss about Mason Jones and Isaiah Joe and these guys playing 30, 30 plus minutes a game, 35 minutes a game. And they're like, so what do you make of that? And he's like, I would rather have a somewhat tired or tired Isaiah Joe in the game shooting a three than I would have the seventh guy on my bench at 100%, uh, you know, where he's not fatigued at all, going in there and shooting a three. It's like, that's how I view it. And I agree with him. Like, that's who, that's who I want. Late in games, you want that. In games, you want that. Now, there'll be times where you see guys come in to give a spell and whatnot. And I think Nick Smith Jr. being added into the mix will be able to provide some spell. But at the end of the day, I just don't think that that's something that people need to be concerned about or, or like criticizing Muss. And it, it's just they do that a lot and they do it with uh, many things, which I'm not saying not every criticism is is unfair. You know, some people bring up his stall ball mentality at the end of games and some people get frustrated by that. Some people get frustrated by, uh, you know, his antics or whatever. But here's my thing you, with coaches, especially you, you can't just pick and choose the good and the bad whenever it suits you. Like when everything's going well and he's winning, like Musk last year towards the end of the stretch and in the Elite Eight, nobody had a peep about any criticism. But do you think Musk was doing anything differently? I think he was managing his team differently or managing his roster differently or having his antics go differently. There was nothing different about last year or the year before. And this year is the same thing. There's nothing different. It's just the results aren't coming in at the way that you were hoping or wanting to. And of course, Nick Smith, Trevin Brazil, big part of that. And that's another reason why he's having to play these guys so many minutes because two of the players that he was counting on being integral parts of this team have not been a part of the team for essentially most of the season. And so a lot of these guys are having to play more minutes. That's a big part of it too. But I have no concern with that. I have no problem with that. And I had this question come in from Jimmy actually on uh, through uh, my Facebook page, John Neighbors. Um, he, it was just, uh, this was actually, and I should apologize, it was coming back from about a week ago, but he says, uh, I started thinking about Nolan Richardson and what he may be thinking about this team as a coach in general and Muss as a coach in general. I wonder if he's ever given Muss advice, especially when it comes to the defensive side of the ball. I know that Muss has a ton of respect for Nolan. It would be interesting to know if they meet on occasion to discuss the team. Not that Muss needs advice, but maybe he continues to seek knowledge uh, possible with every, even as a successful coach. I thought this might be something interesting to dig on for a small segment of your show. And, I, and I'll say this, Jimmy, I, uh, I don't know how much contact he has with Nolan Richardson, but knowing Muss, he always is seeking out advice and talking with coaches and picking their brains. He's done that with coaches, not only in basketball, but coaches in other sports too. Like seeing and hearing him talk to other coaches on campus is such a cool thing. And hearing about whether it's softball or soccer or track, whatever it is, 
he talks to him and tries to get as much uh, knowledge as possible on everything. So I feel like there's no doubt that he's probably talked to Nolan Richardson. Now, has he talked to him often? Is it every day? Don't know. But I am sure that there's been plenty of contact there and plenty of discussions there, too, where both coaches are really high level league coaches, different coaches, but great coaches. And both coaches, I think, uh, have a great understanding of the game of basketball there, too. So point is, his must is not changing. He shouldn't change. He doesn't need to change. And I think that everything's going according to plan as far as how he's doing things. It's just a matter of putting it together. And Arkansas has got six games left, three home, three away. Maybe, just maybe, they'll be able to put it together and have a nice little stretch here. Steal, like if they win against AM tonight, that's that's big time. Do that, win the rest of your home games, regardless of what happens against Tennessee and Bama on the road. You end up being in great shape and being an NCAA tournament team before the SEC tournament game or games even end up starting. Do a little spring football talk and update you with the spring schedule for the Razorbacks here on the other side of the break. Stay with us. You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so final segment here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Spring schedule has officially been released for Arkansas, uh, which is a lot of fun. I... I think, again, like we talked about yesterday, I like spring football. I know a lot of you don't, but I do. I enjoy it. I'm ready for it. And the uh, spring schedule was officially announced where uh, they will practice five times before the spring break. And uh, and it's going to be uh, having a red-white game or the spring game, however you want to look at it, on April 15th. That's a Saturday at noon, which is kind of great because if I'm not mistaken, I think that's the same weekend as the Tennessee baseball series. So it's going to be a big weekend there. Uh, but the first five practices – uh, will be on Thursday and Friday, March 10th and 9th and 10th. Then uh, Sunday, March 12th, Tuesday, March 14th, and then Thursday, March 16th. And then they wrap up for spring break. They won't resume classes uh, until Monday, March 27th. And then they come back for practices on March 28th, the 30th, April 1st, April 4th, April 6th, April 8th, April 11th, April 13th, 14th, and then Saturday being the red-white game. So, that gives us an idea of what the spring practices are going to look like. I assume it's going to be done the same way that it has been before, where you have teams that are when you have players that are going to be out there just kind of going through the motions and maybe we as media people get to see some warm ups and some stretching. But after every practice, there's going to be people made available, whether it's Coach Sam Pittman, new assistant coaches. I think some players will be made available, too, which will be great. So I'm appreciative of Sam Pittman allowing that because there's a lot of coaches and a lot of schools out there that don't allow that type of thing to happen. But overall, I think that this is uh, this is about what I expected as far as how they break up the schedule. And so I can't wait to hear about all the, you know, the newcomers and some of the people that are going to be involved and new coaches and how they're approaching spring football and just the level of excitement and energy that's going to be surrounding the Razorback football program in spring with so many new faces. Because that's the one thing that you can always count on. Excitement is breeded from expectations, but also excitement comes from change. And there's been a lot of change with the Razorback football team, as we all know. So I think there's just going to be some new life, some new pep in the step, and I can't wait to see. And number one, and this is the most important thing, the most important thing of all when it comes to spring football for the Razorbacks, stay healthy. Please, for all that is holy, everybody stay healthy. Everybody. Don't need any dumb things happening in spring. Stay healthy, please. That's all I ask. Appreciate everybody listening into the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on Google Play. You can also get after me on Twitter at Buzz John Neighbors for any questions, comments, concerns that you may have. We'll keep it going from there. Same podcast time, same podcast channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you.